True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Robin and Margaret Bain and three of their children were killed on June 20th, 1994 in their New Zealand home. This was familicide, a mass murder where one member of this family killed the others. Ever since the oldest son, David, returned home from his paper delivery route and called the police that morning, there's been debate over who was responsible. David Bain was 22 years old at the time a music student and aspiring opera singer living with his family. When he got home early that morning, he found all five of his family members dead. His father, Robin, his mother, Margaret, his two sisters, Ara and Lanyette, and his brother, Stephen. At first glance, it appeared that the father, Robin, was responsible and that this was a murder-suicide, but that would change. Join us at the quiet end for the only one who deserved to stay, David Bain. Familicide is very rare, but when it happens, the father is nearly always responsible. Research has shown that these family annihilators are either angry or in a state of prolonged despair. Robin Bain, a troubled man with untreated depression, fit this profile. But the lives and relationships of the Bain family were very complicated and maladjusted. David Bain had plenty of his own issues and evidence, including David's own behavior, pointed to David as the killer. So here's Dickie with a New Zealand beer. That's a treat. It certainly is. So I got a New Zealand beer. I actually persuaded some friends in Australia to send me this which they kindly did, along with some other ones too. So you you might hear me review some Australian or other New Zealand beers. In any event, today's beer is Hop Zombie by Epic Brewing Company in Auckland. It's an Imperial IPA, 8.5% alcohol by volume. Clear amber color, small white head, little bit of lace, nice aroma, citrus fruit, tropical fruit, and pine. And for taste, we have grapefruit, passion fruit, and in a late piney blast, nice mm. hops. Good beer. I know, mm. you're going to say I'm going to make noises. Well, Not a pine fan in my beer. You'll have to try it. I'm willing to try it because I like the fruitiness. I'm just saying that late pine might be a turnoff. Well, it's going to translate into a fairly hoppy kick at the end. So you, you might not be as appreciative of this as I am. Um, I'm thinking not. All right, well, let's open it up anyway. All right, Dickie, come on down here to the quiet end, and you're going to start us out. But before we begin, I'd like to thank Roxanne, who recommended this case to us. Yeah, it's been a while since she did that. Well, of course. It's not instant, but (laughs) thank you, Roxanne. So on with the story. Margaret Cullen married Robin Bain in August of 1969 in Dunedin, New Zealand. Margaret, 25 when she married, wore a white dress and Robin, 33 years old, wore his finest suit. Both Margaret and Robin came from Presbyterian families who went to church regularly. They both were the oldest child in their families, and they shared a love of music. Margaret had three younger sisters, and Robin had a younger sister and two younger brothers. Now, Robin was born in Stratford, a small town where his father managed a dairy. When he was 11 years old, His family moved to a suburb of Wellington called Island Bay, and his father became choir master at the Island Bay Presbyterian Church. Yeah, musical talent definitely did run in this family. Well, it appears. I mean, the the son, David, was a musician and an aspiring opera singer. Yes. And the other siblings all dabbled, at least, in music. Well, and Robin really sang well and played the guitar quite well. Yeah, so we've got a musical family. Yes, Robin completed his schooling at Wellington Technical College, where, 
While excelling in singing and school theater productions, he also did well in sports. Then after college, he trained to be a teacher at Wellington Teachers Training College. Then after completing his 14 weeks of compulsory military training with the Royal New Zealand Air Force, his first teaching assignment was in Martinborough, working with the Maori. Those are the indigenous people of New Zealand. So teaching in remote areas prepared Robin for his move in 1964 to Papua New Guinea, or PNG as they call it. And he taught there as a volunteer for the Presbyterian Bible class movement. Overseas volunteer work was very familiar to Robin's family. His father had helped set up a dairy factory in what is now Bangladesh. Margaret was born in Roxburgh in 1944. Her family lived in a village outside of town that had been built for workers who were building the Roxburgh Dam on the Clutha River. Eventually, Margaret's family moved to Alexandra, where her father owned and managed a shoe store. Now, Margaret was smart, and she was musically talented and worked really hard. She could play the piano very well. She moved to Dunedin and enrolled in Teachers College while she was going to the university part-time and she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree, majoring in anthropology, and then she received her teaching accreditation. After teaching in Christchurch for a few years, Margaret moved back to Dunedin to train kindergarten teachers. So these seem like very altruistic people coming together. Yeah, and they got to know each other through their church activities. They led a youth group at the Anderson's Bay Presbyterian Church, and they held Bible study classes and adventure camps. And this is kind of a yin and a yang thing here. Robin was a skilled outdoorsman who impressed the children with his knowledge and skills. Margaret was a bubbly young woman, making her a good match for the quiet and way more reserved Robin. Now, Robin's parents liked Margaret from the beginning, seeing her as a mature and personable young woman. Richard Matches, a psychologist who worked with Margaret, thought she and Robin were too different. So there's a dissenting voice here, right? Yes. Well, there were certainly problems in the marriage later, so I'd listen to that voice. Well, hindsight. Yes. Robin was an introvert, Margaret an extrovert, and Matches predicted that Margaret's dominating personality would eventually cause him trouble. That's true. Yeah, it got to the point where she spoke of Robin like he was a child who needed her to guide and correct him. So she was clearly the dominant person in that relationship. Especially concerning, though, was how Margaret would belittle Robin in front of other people, which to me is just a low blow. You don't do that. No, you don't. Now, after they were married, the young couple continued working in Dunedin. They lived on Jeffrey Street, just around the corner from Every Street in Anderson's Bay. According to friends and neighbors, Margaret and Robin were very disorganized. They were both hoarders, so their house was a disaster. In 1972, their first son, David Cullenbane, was born, and he was a preemie weighing just 4.4 pounds, which is about 2 kilograms. Then in January 1974, when Margaret was pregnant with their second child, the Baines left Dunedin and moved to PNG where they would work as educators and missionaries for a ministry run by a joint board of the Presbyterian and Methodist churches. And before they left, they bought bought the house at 65 Every Street, where they would live later. They also had other property. Margaret, a frugal type, had purchased two flats, and they sold these after they moved to PNG. But they they kept that house on Every Street, and that's where they're going to return to eventually. Exactly, yeah. The Baines were assigned to Gollum, a small town on the island of New Britain, an island off the main island of PNG. Robin was made deputy principal of the Gollum Teachers College, and his responsibilities included setting the college schedules. He had a very demanding job, kept him quite busy. His friends from that time would remember him always being exhausted and overwhelmed. So Ara, Mary Bain, was born in June of 1974. And Margaret then began to learn as much as she could about the local culture. She immersed herself in traditional healing practices and the local beliefs about spirits and the afterlife. With modern medicine kind of hard to find in PNG, she began to use the traditional techniques with her own family. 
Margaret was really interested in the influence held by the local older women in the village, too. The old women were believed to have special powers, and Margaret wanted to learn from them. But many of her beliefs seemed out of place, especially as she and Robin allowed their home to just sink into complete chaos, to the point where some people were concerned about the Bain children living there. So it must have been quite a place. Uh, Really a disaster yeah. from every viewpoint I've read. The third Bain child was born in March of 76, and they named her Lanyette Margaret Bain. Later that same year, both Margaret and Robin became ill with hepatitis, and neighbors who were familiar with their poor hygiene and slack housekeeping habits were not surprised by this. <laughs> Robin had been hopeful that he would be chosen to take over as the principal of the college in Gollum, but it never happened. By 1979, he had a new job. The Baines family moved to PNG's capital, Port Moresby, where Robin became a senior lecturer at the government-run PNG in-service college. The family lived on a compound that housed the students and the staff, and the family was known at this time to live a very free-spirited lifestyle, and their home was chaotic. Margaret was seen as the outgoing one, while Robin was more reserved, which is how it had been from the beginning. But after they moved to the capital, the Baines' disorganized and sloppy housekeeping persisted. On New Year's Day 1980, Margaret had her fourth child and they named him Stephen Robin Bain. He was very coddled by Margaret and she breastfed him until he was about four years old. Margaret was outgoing and she had become known for her natural healing abilities, but her dirty house led friends to pass up any invitations to come over for dinner and stuff like that. Again, I'm struck with how much of a mess it must have been. I know. That, that people were concerned about the welfare of the kids and they wouldn't eat food in there. Must have been a hovel. Well, yeah, and things like the kids weren't clean, the kids were running around naked. Just yeah. kind of like wild. Not a lot of structure. None. So Margaret and Robin really saw their family as a shining example of a loving and open family. But others saw them as erratic lacking rules and standards of behavior for their children. In fact, the children were on their own quite a lot as they got older because Margaret was often in bed with migraines for days at a time. And apparently Margaret did not like to cook or clean or do any of those household things that are necessary when you have children. So the children did a lot of the chores. Still, the house was a mess. And there were periods of time when Margaret homeschooled her children but, not surprisingly, her lessons were very inconsistent and likely inadequate. Now, the Baines would go back to New Zealand every three years while they lived in PNG. When they went home for Christmas in 1981, Margaret's family discovered that the nine-year-old David could barely read or write. Margaret's sister, Val Boyd, had heard that Margaret had a different idea about schooling. To her, this is Margaret, Education wasn't everything, and there were easier way to learn things if you used life to teach you. Yes, yeah, so she's a little out there, and you could kind of think it's a great idea if there was some kind of structure and constructiveness to it, but there just wasn't. So finally, Margaret's brother-in-law, John, was able to convince her that she was hurting her children and really making them unemployable by not enrolling them in school. So when the family returned to PNG, the children started school in Port Moresby. David went on to attend an international high school, but he was unhappy there. He was bullied, so Margaret decided to keep him home again. Some who noticed his closeness to his mother saw him as kind of isolated and very strange. While in Port Moresby, the entire Bain family was active in the expat musical and dramatic activities. The children played several roles in theater productions. Robin was known for his musical abilities. He put together two bluegrass bands. He ran a private study project. And he was active in fundraising to send children's books to camps that housed refugees. So Margaret and Robin purchased a 54-acre property near the Queensland city of Bundaberg in 1986. Their plan was to set up a horticultural business but by the next year, they were planning to go back to New Zealand. 
So a friend's daughter had been raped in Port Moresby, and they started to worry about their daughter's safety. Also, the children's secondary educations were coming up soon, and that would require a move. David was 16 at this point, with Ara 14, and Laniette 12. Robin wrote to the United Nations expressing an interest in working in developing countries or with refugees in Bhutan, but nothing was offered to him, so the family moved back to Dunedin. They decided that this was their chance to move back into the big house on Every Street that they'd bought before they'd left New Zealand. Yeah, but when they arrived in Dunedin, the Baines were just absolutely shocked at the horrible condition of their big house on Every Street. Now that has to say something. If they were shocked by the condition, (laughs) you would be amazed. Yes, it was really bad. So in the 15 years that they had been away, they had spent no money on maintaining the home and the the tenants that they'd had had trashed the place. Furniture and other household items that they had stored in one of the rooms had been ruined by water damage and rats. Ew. So months of hard work were going to be needed to get the place into livable shape. Now, the transition from Port Moresby, where Robin had been respected and well-paid, the transition from Port Moresby, where Robin had been respected and well-paid, was difficult. David, Lanyette, and Stephen struggled with fitting in at school in the beginning. Robin found work as a substitute teacher, but that meant he was frequently without work or income. Margaret, who had decided to devote herself to her children, was upset and she grew increasingly bitter. She also believed the Presbyterian Church, for whom they had worked in PNG, should have been doing more to help her family. So her dream of returning to a comfortable home with a good income for her husband in New Zealand had fallen apart. She turned her attention to the inadequacies of her husband, telling telling him that he needed to put more effort into their relationship, and she demanded more of his attention. Soon after their return to New Zealand, Margaret tried to recruit longtime family friends into a kind of voodoo cult that she believed could channel energy from above to make things happen. Okay. According to her, the devil was everywhere, even in the family van. <laughs> that just strikes me as funny. I don't know why. Just the possessed van. Yeah. It's an image. Christine. Yeah. So... Friends watched with some bemusement as Margaret tried to exercise the evil from her family's environment. Margaret also rated her family members' levels of evilness. Robin was always the worst, and David was always the least evil. Mama's favorite, the firstborn. Yes. So what Margaret did at this point is she moved into an old caravan in their yard on Every Street in early 1990. So what do you mean by caravan? Well, they say caravan in the New Zealand articles I've read. But when you look at pictures, it looks like a little trailer, like one of those camper trailers. Not big at all. Maybe 10, 12 feet long. But it's typically towed somewhere. I think so. Yeah. It's what it looked like. But throughout all the readings, it's called a caravan. Yeah. I've seen that term for it. Yes. So Margaret moved into it in 1990. And to her, this was a temple on sacred ground. So go figure. I don't know why. But well, she's, she said so. Yeah. But she said that she needed to sleep in the caravan and she needed to wake up slowly to allow her to remember, interpret, and write about her dreams. So the hell with getting the kids up for school, making breakfast, or any of the normal things we've all done. She needs to stay out there, wake up slowly, and then write down what she dreamt about. Right. Now, at the same time, she wanted her family to take more responsibility for meals and housework. Of course. She started behaving more like a roommate than the mother of the family. Six months later, when it got cold out, Robin had to move out to the caravan, and Margaret moved back inside the house. So something about the cold weather made the devil move, I guess. Yeah, or maybe... And the temple. Maybe you could interpret less well when it was cold. That could be it, yes. So Margaret's back in the house, and then in August of 1990, Robin took a job as relieving principal of the small 30-pupil Tyere Beach Primary School. 
This was about an hour's drive from the Every Street house, so kind of far. And the school served a tiny community of farmers, fishing families, and other people who were just, you know, pretty poor. So this was a step down from Robin's previous positions. Yeah, but he had a job. He had a job and he was happy about that. But due to the commute, he began to spend three to four nights a week parked in the caravan by the school. And when he was at home, he would still eat meals with his family. When that old rusty caravan parked at the school started to get some complaints, he moved it to another spot near the school. Now, sleeping in the caravan seemed to serve several purposes. It kept him away from the tension at home for at least part of the week. It also gave Margaret full control of the household. It also saved money on gas, and saving money was always a big part of the family's belief system. Now, Robin's salary went directly into a joint savings account each week to support the family. Margaret withdrew cash as she needed it, but Robin had to ask her for permission before he could make a withdrawal. And Robin soon became an important and well-liked man in the Tayeri Beach community. In 1992, he applied for senior positions in Dunedin, Wanaka, and Gore, and in 1993 applied for six positions, two of which were outside Dunedin. Meanwhile, Margaret became stranger, if that's possible. Oh, it's always possible. And she kept a diary of her everyday activities, like taking the children shopping, cooking meals, and her obsession with fruit canning. So that's one thing she did like to do that was domestic. There were jars and jars of fruit and preserves in that house. But then Margaret began to describe her husband Robin as the son of Belial, a Hebrew reference to the son of darkness. That's probably not good. No. But, you know, Robin wasn't the only one who was evil, according to Margaret. She liked to exercise the food of evil at parties, and she blamed her children's routine illnesses as the work of the devil. So she's getting a little strange. She kind is. Kind of scary strange, not uh, just freewheeling strange. Yes. And as she got stranger, her reputation spread. She soon became known around town as maybe more than a bit odd. Well, and I think that kind of spread to people's opinions of the entire family. Oh, sure. She was described as being very overbearing, opinionated, and unrealistic. Margaret, who enjoyed shocking people, delved into her interest in alternative medicine. So it was kind of gross in many ways. Like, for example, her home treatment for a cold included mixing up a tea of urine and phlegm. Where do people get these ideas? Well, anyway, she also practiced self-hypnosis and meditation. She was closest to David of all of her children, and she taught him many of her techniques. Now, one of her hobbies was to go around to garage sales and secondhand shops and flea markets and bring back just carloads of junk to fill up the already cluttered house. Robin was the same way. He was a hoarder. So soon the house had this huge collection of books, clothing, furniture, and knickknacks. Basically just junk. While Margaret had become skilled in making pottery in PNG, she didn't do that at all back in Dunedin. She liked to garden, go to the movies, can fruit, and of course interpret her dreams. And when the family was all together, Margaret started to ignore Robin as if he didn't even exist. With time, Margaret also began planning for a new house, which she planned to build on every street after she demolished their current home. Writing in her diary, she said that God had told her she must do the plans herself with the house created and facilitated by God. Sure. The plans involved David, who, according to Margaret's diary, was going to spend 1993 building, while Ara'a would take the year to concentrate on her education. Margaret set up a design office with a homemade drawing board sitting on top of a desk. With books on design and building regulations there, she made her plans to have energy-efficient features, like small windows to keep the heat in. This house was supposed to be a sanctuary where the family and strangers could retreat from the pressures of life. Margaret said it was a place where people could find freedom. David described it as a place where people could be at peace and get some rest from the outside world. 
Each of the children would have one of six or seven bedrooms in the two-story house. David and his mother would have the two main bedrooms separated by a shared bathroom. While Robin understandably worried about the expense, David told several people that his father was not wanted by the family anymore and he would have no part in the planning of the new house. So we can see the dysfunction building and it's getting a little bit troublesome. Well, I'm, I am worried about this plan with the two main bedrooms <laughs> upstairs are going to be taken up by David and his mother. Yeah, no talk of the father I mean, at all. That sounds like we're almost getting into the incest stage. Yeah, and there were whispers and rumors of that, for sure. But the whole thing is that this new house was never going to happen. It wasn't realistic. They could barely afford to just get by. But, you know, despite being written off as insignificant by Margaret, Robin was the family's main financial support. The family lived a very frugal life, but Margaret seemed to believe that if Robin left and took his half of the matrimonial property, God would just step in to provide what was needed and she could build her sanctuary. So maybe he was kind of in the way, the way she perceived things. Yes. On a 1993 visit, Margaret's sister Val and her husband John came by for afternoon tea. And after they asked if Robin would be joining them, they noticed that all of the children looked at Margaret for approval before they went to get him. As Robin withdrew more and more into himself, Margaret described him as a ghost who only came into the house for food and to watch TV. So they are in desperate need of some couples counseling. Boy, I guess. In January of 1994, friends of the Baineses visited and they were absolutely shocked at Robin's appearance. He was very thin and pale, almost looking emaciated. Yeah, if you see pictures, he looked like he was 80 years old when he was in his 50s. Yeah, the house was a mess, and the kitchen and bathroom were disgusting. Margaret's diaries from around that time portrayed her as an unhappy woman, always angry with her husband, younger children, and even David, who was usually considered by Margaret to be the least demon-infected family member. That's high praise. It sure is. You're the best of the worst. <laughs> yeah. By 1993, Margaret's perceived close connection to God had made her confident that Robin would be leaving her, and this is what she wanted. But it didn't happen, and that frustrated her. Well, Mark Buckley, who said that he became friends with David in high school because he felt sorry for him, had gone to the Bain house often, and he described the family as nice, open, and loving. According to Buckley, around 1990, when both he and David were in their last year at school, David talked about a girl across the road whom he would see out running in the mornings and he was attracted to her. He really liked her and he was excited when he got to speak with her on occasion. And he said to Buckley, if he really wanted to, he could rape her without getting caught. He could get away with it, he said, by using his paper route as an alibi. David knew the route that this woman ran and said that people would meet him to get their paper and they would see him at different times of the morning. So he explained he could drop off some papers to people who would not normally see him at an earlier time than usual and that would free up the time. Then afterwards he could complete his route delivering the papers to the people who would normally see him at these normal times. So after he explained all this to Buckley, he pulled out a book from down beside his bed, and this was like a text or a notebook. And David read to Buckley from the book, giving certain times he would see people on his run. So it's kind of a diary of what's going on on his paper route that he was keeping. So it kind of seemed like he was planning on raping this woman. He was certainly considering it. That's another worry. It's very worrying. I mean... As far as we know, he's not been a guy who's dated a lot, or if at all. Mm-hmm. And he's attracted to this girl. And, and what's he tell his friend? Boy, I'd like to rape her. And I could get away with it. And I could get away with it. Well, and also, Buckley wasn't the only one that David had shared his rape fantasy with. Another friend also said he'd heard David talking about possible rape of the jogger and how he could get away with that. Pharmacist Patricia Napier met David in late 1992. 
when she was working as a wardrobe volunteer for the opera company. So she was impressed with David's talent and his friendly personality. Fellow singer Lindsay Robertson described David's voice as a beautiful deep tenor and found him to be a good friend. But others in the company weren't so impressed with David, and he was often the victim of their practical jokes. Many were uncomfortable with David's overly friendly manner and felt he was just a big dork trying too hard to be liked. David worked hard on his academics, and he actually got accepted into school to become a veterinarian. But that was not his passion, and pretty quickly he dropped out. And then he took a job at Opera Alive. He enrolled in the university to study classical music. David took voice lessons, hoping to become a professional opera singer. At home, David became controlling and tried to take on much of a fatherly role. His sister, Ara complained about his controlling nature. She also mentioned to friends at school her fears of David and how uncomfortable she was with David owning a gun. She said that when he became angry, he would threaten to shoot her and her siblings. Now, that's not a small thing. It seems like she was kind of just saying it offhandedly. Yeah, did uh, the family investigate that any further? I don't think so, no. While rehearsing for Godspell on a warm day in 1993, David collapsed on stage, and then he appeared to have a seizure. He was heard mumbling something like, The hands are coming to get me. A nurse who was there took care of him, and after, she told some of the cast members not to worry because she knew he'd been faking it. She explained that people who had real seizures didn't present in the way David had. So, just a little bit about these fake seizures that David had, because he has some later, and it's kind of significant. I guess one of the reasons why people thought he was faking is because his eyes did not roll back in his head. He didn't seem really spaced out. He would make eye contact and he seemed like he was still, you know, mentally present. So as a physician, how do you feel about that? Well, your eyes don't have to roll back, but you're not really seeing when you're having a seizure. So if he's making eye contact with people and seems to respond to them, that would make it unlikely that he's having a seizure. Maybe if you saw it happening, you'd just know that's not real. Right. Especially if you've seen real seizures. And then typically, after a seizure, you have uh, what's called a post-ictal state, where you're just kind of confused and out of it. Yeah, and I don't think that that was something that happened. If you have the seizure, the seizure's over, and you're totally back to normal, that would speak against the thing being a seizure. Right. So the people from Opera Live Company spent time in a nearby karaoke bar where they'd have fun singing, you know, the latest pop songs. One of them, Heather Hall, who would later become David's girlfriend for a while, was such a good singer that she was hired by the bar to help. But David would turn up from time to time and he would sing his favorite Tom Jones songs. (laughs) And none of his peers really liked that. It was kind of out of place. So some of the performers avoided David because he seemed just very socially awkward, and that was just one of the things of many. But in addition to his singing, David enjoyed shooting in his free time. He got his firearms license in 1990, and he eventually bought a 22 Winchester semi-automatic rifle from a private seller in February of 1993. David then bought and fitted a Silent Kill brand silencer on his gun. His explanation for having a silencer was that when he went out rabbit shooting, it prevented the sound of the first shot from scaring off all the rabbits in the area. He also said that he shot possums at night using a spotlight, so a silencer was good for that as well. So as someone who's never done any of these things, I don't know if I have much opinion on it, but I have never really heard of hunters putting silencers on their guns. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. No, but it would be unlikely. Yeah, or at least unusual, right? Yeah. Yeah, because I thought silencers were illegal. Well, we don't know about New Zealand's laws. True. So we can't really speak to that. But there's really no need for it. I mean, if you're out hunting, just go ahead and shoot. Well, his reasons were actual reasons. Well... The first shot would scare off the other rabbits, I imagine. 
And if you're shooting in the middle of the night, it's better to be quiet. <laughs> okay. So whether they're made up or true, they do kind of make sense. A very tough kind of makes sense. I guess they do. If you just take it at face value, yeah. Yeah. So of all the Bain children, Laniette seemed to struggle the most after the family's return from PNG. She left both school and the family home near the end of 1993 when she was just 17, and she told friends she had no income because her parents wouldn't sign the forms to get her on the welfare benefit. Friends talked about problems between Lanyette and her mother Margaret because Lanyette rebelled against her mother's religious beliefs. Now, if you believe her side of things, Lanyette had already lived through an unusual amount of chaos in her young life. She told Paul Hewson, a physical education teacher at her school, that she had been raped and had a black baby when she was in PNG. But later, apparently forgetting she told him about this black baby, she said she'd had an abortion and then attempted to kill herself by cutting her wrists. But she had no scars on either wrist. So this just makes me think she has a lot of emotional problems, probably a lot of them from the way she was raised. Although we have to say there could be a genetic component because there does seem to be some mental illness coming down through the parents, at least the mother. Sure, but they're undiagnosed, so you, you can't make a real strong case for a genetic basis. Well, no, not without delving further, right? Yeah, but who knows? It could be environmental, too. She's just grown up in this stuff for so long that she starts having psychiatric issues. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind that that was a factor. I just don't know how much of it was that. Yeah. Plus, being a teenager really sucks anyway for most people. It can. So, yeah. Lanyette rented a room in a boarding house after she left home. And at the boarding house, each of the boarders had their own room, but they shared a bathroom. Now, her brothers, David and Stephen, helped her move in. And then once out on her own, Lanyette needed a job, so she answered an ad in the local newspaper. Now, the woman running the ad was a prostitute in her late 20s who was working in a massage parlor. She wanted to set up her own escort business and needed someone to serve her clients who wanted doubles. No, no, I read that, and it took me a while to think, what the hell are doubles? And then I thought, Jill, you're so naive. You're so stupid. It means two women. They want two women at once. Yeah, well, maybe not necessarily at once, but two per session. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. They want not just one woman to come to them, but two. Right. So this woman needed to hire another young woman to be a prostitute, basically, a sex worker. Yeah, so Lanyette soon began working as a prostitute under the name Paige. And one day Lanyette asked this woman why she'd become a prostitute. And she told Lanyette that she had been raped as a teenager. So this upset Lanyette, and she burst out crying. She said that the same thing had happened to her, and that the rapist was her own father. So she did say quite a few of these things about her father raping her and incest going on in her household. So it seems like there might be some truth to that. Yeah. Although she also had showed herself as someone who would make things up. So it's hard to say. But a lot of people who go into sex work have been sexually abused in their childhood. Yes, they have. Yeah. And the woman who hired her said that she seemed very innocent, but she caught on real quick. Whatever that means. <laughs> okay. So in September of 1993, Lanyette met 27-year-old Dean Robert Cottle in a bar. According to Cottle, they became friendly and they would see each other about three or four times a week. Talking about her family, she told Cottle that her father had been having sex with her for years. She said it was one of the reasons for her leaving home. She was also tired of her mother hassling her and she didn't like to sit around talking about God, she said. So he said he was a friend of hers, maybe a boyfriend, but then there were also rumors that he may have been acting like a pimp for her at one point. Another friend who got to know the Baines in 1992 had seen a rapid decline in Lanyette through 1993. Lanyette had always been a bubbly, vibrant girl, and she became very introspective and dark. Now that could just be part of adolescence, a phase, or it could be that something was going on. 
But according to this friend, Lanyette's attitude about David was very strange, because sometimes she referred to him as my David. She said that David was very jealous, too, of her relationships, and that he had broken up all of her relationships with men. So that's another avenue of incest that is possible. Yes, it is. So on Saturday, June 18th, Robin worked on the gutters at the Every Street house. Neighbor Wayne Marsh was watching, and Robin told him that there was a rift in the family because Margaret was determined to build a new house, but they didn't have the money. Yeah, try telling that to Margaret. Well, she'd just probably tell him, well, get some. It's your fault. David's classic lecturer, Henry Love, ran David's rehearsal and thought that David was relaxed and acting like his normal self. Several people recalled seeing Lanyette that day. At this point, she had stopped working as a sex worker and was working as a waitress. So she stopped by for a chat with a friend on her way to work. And to the friend, Lanyette seemed agitated. She said she was going to work, and after work, David was going to pick her up and take her home for a family meeting. She said that she was scared. She had uh, some trepidation about the meeting and didn't want to go. She said something about disliking and also being afraid of David. She also said that David had told her if she didn't come to the meeting, he would come and get her, and he would take her there kicking and screaming if he had to. So this was a very odd thing, because no one knows what this meeting was supposedly about and why David was saying he was having it. So, of course, it would be looked back on as a ploy. Sure. After the sisters, Lanyette and Ora, finished their shift at the cafe where they were both working, David picked them up about 5.45 p.m. According to David, they went to Lanyette's apartment first to get something, and then they stopped at the local supermarket to do a little shopping. When they got home, Robin and Margaret were watching TV there. Lanyette and David went in the car to get chips from the local takeaway bar, while Ara went out to babysit. So Ara wasn't at home for dinner, and according to David, the family had their meal, then sat down to watch a nature video. At 8.30 p.m., the video was stopped because his parents wanted to watch Prime Suspect. That's a show you like, Dickie. Oh, it has the incomparable Helen Mirren in it. Yeah, it's a police drama, which the parents really liked. Very popular show, I I guess. I haven't seen it yet. It was. But David said that he went to bed just before 9 p.m., and he read a little bit before falling asleep. Then on Monday morning, June 20th, 1994, David Bain completed his early morning paper route. At 7.09 a.m., he called 111. That's the local emergency number. Dispatcher France Edwards took the call. It had been just about an hour since she started her shift for the day. She could hear a man on the line panting and groaning. Police or ambulance, she asked. That's when David Bain cried out that his father was dead, so she put his call through to the ambulance service. Tom Dempsey was alone in the Dunedin St. John Ambulance Control Room when the call came in. Help! They're all dead! The caller groaned. What's the matter? Dempsey asked. They're all dead. I came home and they're all dead. My family, they're all dead. Hurry up! That's pretty good, actually. You kind of sound like him there. Good job. (laughs) After getting the address, Dempsey asked for the caller's name and telephone number. Caller said that his name is David Bain, and he gave the phone number. Now, the way David gave the details surprised Dempsey. He usually had trouble getting information from his frantic callers. Soon, David became panicky again. He wanted to know where the ambulance, when the ambulance would get there. And he began speaking very fast. When asked to calm down, David yelled, Fuck up! Shut up! I've never heard the phrase, fuck up, but I kind of like it. I think we should find some ways to use that in everyday conversation. Okay. Okay. Sure. The police... no, I can't believe you've never heard the term fuck up. Well, I've heard he's a fuck up. Yeah. But I've never heard someone yell, fuck up. What the heck does that mean? I don't know. Maybe he's trying, just trying to get attention. Yeah. No, that's a thought. So the police arrived and knocked on the front door, asking David to open it. An ambulance pulled up and waited outside. Somebody was taking cover behind the ambulance. As officers walked up the path in the dark, they saw a head and shoulders in one of the windows by the front door. So the person appeared to be sitting on the floor. 
but of course they're worried that this figure might start shooting at them. So they turned off their flashlights and hid behind a bush and just kind of watched for a minute. Now nothing happened, and it was still dark out, so slowly they began to walk up the path. When they got to the porch, it was surrounded by trees and shrubs, which I would imagine they weren't really big landscapers either. Oh, probably not. So that blocked out the light from the street. Now to the left of the front door through a window, though, they could see David. This house has two stories. This house had two stories, and it was set back quite a bit from the road. The front door was in the middle of the front of the house on ground level. Upon entering the house through the front door, the officers would enter a hallway. To their right was a living room, which had some chairs and tables. To one side of this room was a curtained-off alcove, and it was in this living room that Robin had been shot. Across the hallway was David's room, and next to David's room on the left of the hallway were steps down to the lower level of the house. So if you continued down the hallway past the stairs on the right, you'd see Margaret's bedroom, then the youngest, Stephen's room. And on the left was the room where Lanyette had been sleeping at the time of her murder. So down the stairs to the lower level, there were these three rooms, and Ara's bedroom, a kitchen and a bathroom where the washing machine was. On the left was the room where Lanyette had been sleeping at the time of her murder, Down the stairs to the lower level, there were three rooms. Aurora's bedroom, a kitchen, and a bathroom where the washing machine and a dirty clothes basket were kept. So why don't you go over the prosecution's account of the murders of all of these family members? Yeah, this is how they figured it out. Yes, this is how they said it happened. From the evidence that they had. Yes. So about 5 a.m. or earlier, on the morning of Monday, June 20th, 1994... David got up and dressed. He took his twenty two caliber Winchester semi-automatic rifle from his wardrobe, and he unlocked the trigger lock with a key that he kept in a jar on his desk. He took ammunition from the wardrobe. He then shot and killed, in unknown order, his mother, his two sisters, and his brother. There was a violent struggle with Stephen, who was strangled and shot, and during the struggle, a lens of the glasses David was wearing fell out in Stephen's room. These killings, especially those of Lanyette and Stephen, were very bloody, and as a result, David and his clothing got stained with blood. So he washed and changed his clothes, which left blood spots in the bathroom laundry room, and after putting his blood-stained clothes in the washing machine, he started the machine. And just like normal, he left the house about 5.45 a.m. to deliver newspapers. He did this more quickly than usual, and returned home at about 6.42 a.m., He went upstairs to the living room and turned on the computer at 6.44 a.m., and he typed a message. Sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay. So, he killed everyone in the family except Robin, who was out in the caravan, went out and did his paper route with all the dead bodies in the house and his father alive out in the yard, then came back and killed his father, and then typed this message on the computer screen, as some kind of suicide note from his father. David did know that his father normally came into the house from the caravan just a little bit before 7 a.m. And once he was in the house, he would pray in the living room. So David had waited with the loaded rifle in the alcove off the living room. And when his father entered the room and knelt to pray, shot him at close range in the head. He then arranged the scene to make it look like his father had committed suicide and called emergency services to report the killings, and pretended to be in distress. So that's how the police and the prosecutors saw it. Right, they did. And that's looking at David's fantasy of the jogger, how he could manipulate his paper route to provide an alibi. Sounds very, very familiar. That's why that's so significant. David's recounting of the events that morning was different. According to David, he got up at his usual time, put on the running shoes and shorts, took his yellow newspaper bag, and set off on his newspaper route with his dog at about 5.45 in the morning. He ran a lot of the way, as he usually did, and he paid attention to how long he took. He arrived home at about 6.42 or 6.43 a.m., entered by the front door, 
noticed that his mother's light was on and went to his own room. In his room, he hung up his paper bag, took off his shoes, took off his walkman, and put it on the bed. He then went downstairs and into the bathroom. There, he washed his hands to get off the black newsprint and sorted out some colored clothes and jerseys. And this included a red sweatshirt he had worn on his paper run for the past week. Yeah, so to these New Zealand folks, a jersey's a sweater. I figured that out. Okay. <laughs> I think I knew that. But yeah, they called his sweaters jerseys. He started the machine, then went upstairs to his room, turned on the light, and he noticed bullets in the trigger lock on the floor. So he went to his mother's room, found her dead. He visited the other rooms, heard Lanyette gurgling, and found his father dead in the lounge. Which is the living room. Okay. He was devastated, finding his family all killed. He rang the emergency services in a state of acute distress. His version assumed that his father, Robin, having killed the other family members, had switched on the computer, typed in a message for David before he committed suicide. Well, it was never suggested that anyone other than Robin or David could have been responsible for these killings, or that the killer, whoever it was, was not responsible for all of the killings. So the real question was, was the killer David Bain or Robin Bain? After the emergency call and after police arrived on the scene, they were locked out. There was a key in the front door, but it still wouldn't open, and an officer called out to David asking him to open the door. And David replied, no, they're all dead. So an officer picked up a log from a pile of firewood on the porch and used it to break a pane of glass in the front door. He cleared the glass from the frame with his revolver and then reached through and opened the door from the inside. As they burst through, the officers saw David's bedroom, the first on the left as they entered, was dimly lit and his door was slightly open. And he was found sitting on the floor at the end of his bed, wailing, apparently hysterically, saying, They're all dead. They're all dead. Officer Andrew was left to keep an eye on David, so he stood by the door of David's bedroom, and he raised his gun to cover the other officers, Wiley and Stapp, because they don't know if the killer's still there. Right. And they made their way down the hallway. Another officer, Kim Stevenson, asked David how many people live in the house. There are six of us here, David told her. Stevenson then went into the room opposite David's bedroom, where she found the body of Robin Bain lying partly on his side on the floor. A rifle with a silencer and a telescopic sight was on the carpeted floor. It was lying across perpendicular to his body. So Officer Wiley shined his flashlight into the next room on the left, The body of Lanyette Bain, 18, was lying under a comforter on a bed that was up against the far wall of that room. To the right, in another room with a curtain pulled across the entrance, was the body of Margaret Bain, 50 years old. She was under her blanket on her waterbed. The family dog, a Keyshound, was on the right side of the bed, and she growled and barked, but then she settled down easily when an officer spoke nicely to her. Then David called out for her, Casey, Casey. Now this house was dirty and chaotic. It had a foul, musty odor. In Margaret's room, there was yet another doorway that was covered by a blanket, and this led to the lower level of the house. Officers Stapp and Wiley slowly went down the steps. When they got to the bottom, they turned right into the kitchen, where they saw dirty dishes piled up high on a small red bench near a large wood-burning stove. Stapp covered for Wiley as he went right again down a narrow passageway, and this was lined with shelves full of jars of fruit and preserves. He came to another doorway covered by two curtains. He shined his flashlight into this room, where he found the body of 19-year-old Araa Bain, who was on her back on the floor with her legs tucked beneath her. So it looked as though she had been kneeling and fell backwards when she was shot. So this is just a horrendous find. Isn't it? Yeah. I would imagine police officers go through their whole careers seeing nothing like this. No, they don't. Five bodies. So as the officers were walking through the kitchen to the laundry and bathroom, they could hear David crying upstairs. So Stapp and Wiley went back upstairs, and Wiley announced they had found four bodies. Stevenson told them that there should be six people in the house, including David. So they retraced their steps, and in the spot they thought held Margaret's wardrobe, they found another bedroom. 
Room was a mess, even worse than the rest of the house. And on the floor, they saw a boy's body covered in blood. So this was 14-year-old Stephen. Wiley shined his flashlight around the room and noted that a fight must have occurred there. And after Stapp called out that they'd found the fifth body, Officer Andrew noticed that David started to shake like he was having a seizure. He continued watching as David fell backwards between the bed and the wall. But Officer Andrew noticed one strange thing about David. During his seizure, he had no change in his eyes. He still appeared alert, and he was able to make eye contact with the officer. So Andrew pulled David out by one arm and put him in the recovery position to watch that he was okay. Two EMTs were called in to check on him, and they were really confused by David's shaking. It looked to them like he was faking. And David's heart rate was normal at around 70 to 76 beats per minute, and his breathing was normal and regular. Craig Wombwell, the chief ambulance officer, was accompanied by an officer to each of the bodies so he could check them for any signs of life. And Robin was warmer than expected, warmer than everybody else. In David's room, the police found a trigger lock, which is a device that fits around the rifle's trigger and is locked with a key. It was about 10 minutes after 8 when Detective Kevin Anderson of the Dunedin Criminal Investigation Branch, CIB, arrived. He saw David and noticed that whenever someone spoke on the police radio, David would look over and he appeared to be listening. Within the next hour, officers saw David try to get up, saying he had to go to university. He became really restless and complained of pain in his head that was like a knife. Detective Anderson also noticed he had a greenish bruise on the right side of his forehead. In addition to the dead bodies, police found the note that was typed on the family PC which read, Sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay. Now, much of the evidence at the scene didn't make sense for a murder-suicide. Police soon believed that David had been the shooter and Robin one of the victims. So relatives from both sides of the family came into town to support David and help him make funeral arrangements. David stayed at the home of Margaret's sister and her husband after the murders. His aunt talked to him about the tragedy, trying to find out what could have led to such violence. And at one point, David had a breakdown. He said things like, black hands are coming to get me. Dying, everyone dying. Black hands, black hands, I can't stop them. They came to take them away. Black hands dying all around, dying everywhere. So this is interesting to me. Would someone having a breakdown say something like that? To me, it seems a little overly dramatic. And remember, he was into the theater. Yeah, well, it sounds like that, but you'd have to, I think, look at it in context to be able to say, yeah, I think he could be faking it. Explain further? Well, I mean, obviously, if he's the one who did the killing, he'd like to do something to draw the attention away from him. Right. So he picks that time to have his so-called seizure. Yeah, but this talk about black hands, you could see it as faking to make it more dramatic, like I just mentioned, but then on the other hand... Why would he see black hands? If he wasn't there during the murders, it's kind of weird that he's saying, everyone dying, I can't stop them, they came to take them away. And police really thought this kind of put him at the scene during the murders, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and he's used that before. He's, He's had a seizure previously where he had black hands. We discussed that earlier. Yes, yep. But this made David's aunt believe that David had witnessed the killings which would mean he had done them, really. Yeah. David was very insistent about how the funeral should go, so his behavior there was kind of looked at as odd. He insisted on choosing each family member's clothing, the music that would be played, and he even had to approve of any eulogies that would be read. Now, some thought it was more like he was producing a theater production than arranging the funerals of his family members, but that could also be an innocent thing. Maybe he just cared about his family members and how their funerals would be. Oh, sure. Now, as the police did their investigation, where they processed evidence and statements, they soon began to close in on David as their suspect. His account of events that morning were analyzed, and inconsistencies were found. For instance, he said that he had found his mother dead with her eyes open. But when the police found Margaret, her eyes were closed. So had David lied? Or maybe he closed her eyes himself. 
Now, just off the living room was an alcove that the family had used as a computer room, and a heavy curtain separated the two spaces. So, in processing the scene, a spent casing had been found near the computer, making it look like the gun had been shot from there. So, did this mean that David had waited behind the curtain for his father to come into the house and then shot him as he knelt down to pray? Well, that's certainly what investigators decided had happened. Sure. If Robin had killed his family and himself, the evidence just didn't really support it. For one thing, David's gun had been used as the murder weapon. And then why would Robin wear gloves if he was intending to kill himself anyway? And why would Robin have chosen to spare David of all family members? He and David were not close, and David had always taken his mother's side in their arguments. Now also, the only note left behind was that one sentence on the computer. As an avid reader and a lover of literature, Robin seemed like the type who would have left a more poetic note behind. And considering his age, the generation he came from, a handwritten note would have made more sense. So he had kind of done things that would have made David look like the killer. Yeah. And why would he do that? I don't think he had any animosity towards his son, even though they didn't get along great. There didn't seem like any reason for him to keep David alive and set David up as the killer. To me, that's a real stretch of the imagination. No, I think if if he's killing his family, he's going to kill the whole family, the entire family, not spare David. Yeah, because people who do those murder-suicides think, usually, that they're saving the family from having to suffer or something like that. So sparing one person and leaving them as a suspect just doesn't make sense. Not at all. So some of David's fellow students told the police about some odd behavior they had noticed from David in the time leading up to these murders. A couple of weeks earlier, in early June, he had become restless in the middle of choir practice and just walked out. Then he went and sat alone in an empty room and rocked back and forth. Also at a concert, David seemed to space out and it took his girlfriend a few minutes to get him to respond to her. Also, on the Sunday night before the murders, it had been David who was summoning the entire family to the house for a family meeting. And this could have been a way for him to get everyone there in order to kill them. Could have been. On the morning of the killings, David said that he arrived home after completing his paper route at around 6.42 a.m., but he didn't call emergency services until 7.09 a.m. So during this 25-minute window... He told investigators that he believed he had blacked out. Another inconsistency was that David claimed that after he had found his mother's body, he called out for his dad. He said that he went to look for his dad and found him dead in the living room. But he didn't go and look for his siblings. He then called 111 and said they're all dead. How could he have known that they're all dead without checking them? Exactly. And he would change that story to his version where he did check. But at the time, he didn't say that. Right. So just because you find your mother and father dead, you wouldn't assume that they're all dead. No, you would not. And then there was David's plan to rape that woman, which he had shared with a couple of his friends. This planned fantasy of using the paper route as an alibi was just so close to what had actually happened on the morning his family was murdered. Shortly before these murders, Margaret told a friend that she was concerned about David who was having dark premonitions and hallucinations. She also told her sister that David was acting like a father figure to his siblings, but he needed to know his place because they already had a father. So that could explain why he decided to kill his mother, who he was so close to. There may have been a falling out there. And also some mental illness, some hallucinations. Yeah, definitely. And then there was the physical evidence. Four of David's fingerprints were found on the murder weapon. A palm print from his little brother Stephen was on the silencer, likely made as Stephen tried to push the gun away. David had no blood on his clothing or hands when the police arrived. They would find some spots of blood on his socks. He admitted to washing his hands in the laundry room, and a drop of blood was found in the sink there. So he wasn't just washing newspaper print off of his hands, apparently. There were also smears of blood on the washing machine and on the box of detergent. A green sweater of David's, which he put in the wash that morning, had matching fibers found beneath Stephen's fingernails. Now remember, Stephen was the only family member who appeared to have put up a fight. 
When asked about that sweater, David first said that was a Ra's sweater, but then he changed the story and said the sweater belonged to his father Robin. The same sweater had rubbed up against door frames in the house and left blood smears with the knit pattern on the wood. So that's just really not explainable. Not with a murder-suicide. Exactly. David did have some injuries, which he couldn't adequately explain. He had a scraped knee, and he had some abrasions on his forehead. He also had scrapes on his chest as well, along with red, scraped, and swollen knuckles on his hands. So police theorize that these injuries occurred during a struggle with Stephen. David's blood-covered opera gloves and a lens from eyeglasses were found in Stephen's room. And there's a pair of eyeglasses with one lens missing in David's room. Oh, okay. Then there were five bloody sock footprints found on the floor of Margaret's room. These prints tracked down to where Lagnette was found and left the room as well. Yes, yeah, so they tracked into the room and then out of and the room. Out. Yeah, they could pretty much read the pathway. Yeah. In less than one week, David Bain was arrested for his family's murders. He was accused of plotting and carrying out the shooting of each of his family members and David claimed he was innocent. He actually became very angry and felt he had been denied his rights. In his early days in jail, he spent most nights crying, and he was not allowed to attend his family member's funeral, which really upset him. Just two weeks after the murders, with the approval of the Bain Family Trust and David himself, the Bain house was burned to the ground by firefighters. Nobody wanted it around. It was a bad place. Plus, it was a disaster anyway, before the murders. Well, it was sounding like it was going to come down anyway. So David's murder trial began on May 8, 1995, and it lasted until May 29th. During the trial, over 60 witnesses were called to testify, and over 20 written statements were read aloud to the jury. Both the prosecutor's case and the defense case were very complex. During the trial, the judge needed to give several rulings and two of these were related to evidence the defense wanted to present from witness Dean Cottle. Lagnette had a cell phone registered in the name of Cottle, a former boyfriend and or pimp, we're not sure, and this led the police to interview him just days after the murders occurred. Cottle stated that he had met Lagnette about 10 months before her death in a Dunedin bar, and they had become good friends. According to Cottle, Lagnette had told him that she had been a prostitute and that her father Robin had been having sex with her for about a year and was still doing so. This was one of the reasons for her leaving home, he said. And later, she had said she was going to make a fresh start and her parents had been questioning her and she had decided she was going to tell them everything. Mm -hmm. So the judge's first ruling was given on May 25th. And in giving his reasons, the judge acknowledged that Cottle's evidence was hearsay, but he didn't rule out admission of the evidence. So he told the attorneys the present crimes were horrific, and the jury, like every other person, will be considering why they occurred. Any evidence that might shed light on this must, in my view, be relevant. A motive for Robin Bain is certainly relevant to the primary issue in the case. If sufficient relevance were the only test, then I would be inclined to admit the evidence despite its remoteness in time and questionable probative value. So he's going to allow the testimony. However, the judge was unable to conclude that it would be reasonably safe to admit the evidence or to conclude that the evidence would have sufficient reliability or probative value. He had already recorded that Mr. Cottle, although subpoenaed to appear as a witness, had tried to avoid testifying and he couldn't be located to appear. So that's that. He's not going to testify. So the second ruling was given on May 26th after the prosecuting counsel had completed his closing statement to the jury when Mr. Cottle voluntarily came into the court office in answer to a warrant for his arrest. So Mr. Cottle was questioned about his failure to appear and his recall of what Lagnette had said to him. But he seemed to be confused about what she had told him and when. So the judge concluded that his evidence would not be reasonably safe or reliable and said he didn't find Cottle credible. So he ruled against the admission of the evidence, not because it was hearsay, but because it was unreliable. And because of this, the jury never learned about any incest as a possible motive for Robin to be the killer. 
which the defense really would see as a disadvantage for the client. Yes. For David, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, David did testify in his own defense. He wore bright colored sweaters, which his mother had knitted for him, to court each day. He testified about how close his family was. But the prosecution said that David was a disturbed young man and that the only other possible killer, Robin, had been ruled out based on the forensic pathologist's evidence. There had been no blood on Robin's shoes or socks. Robin was right-handed, and the fatal bullet wound was on his left temple. Unusual, but not impossible. Highly unusual. And if he's right-handed, that means he has to kind of reach across his chest or upper body. Well, it's a long gun, so he had to hold it at a distance from himself. Yeah. Yeah. Tough to do. So one other thing that the prosecution brought up was that David had said that he had heard Lynette gurgling, implying that he must have been home just moments after she was shot. If she was still alive, why didn't David try to save her? The prosecutor said that only one person could have heard Lynette gurgling, and that was the murderer. Well, that does make sense, because she died quickly. Yeah. In New Zealand criminal court, it's really interesting because the judge gives a summary intended to summarize the relevant law, summarize both the prosecutor and defense's cases, and review the evidence. Now also this is intended to give the jury a structure that they can use in their decision-making process. This summing up is often the most important step that a judge takes in a trial before sentencing, and I personally think that is a great idea, but that's not how our system works, so I digress. But in his summation, the judge in David Bain's trial listed the points particularly relied on by the defense, and then, drawing from the closing statement of the prosecutor, the points relied on by the Crown prosecutor. And there were 12 points. The first one, the rifle and ammunition, were David's, and the key to the trigger lock was in an unusual place where he seemed to have hidden it. And the second one, David's bloody fingerprints were found on the murder weapon. Third, David's blood-stained gloves were found in Stephen's room. Fourth, David had fresh injuries to his forehead and his knee. There was no explanation for them, and the nature of them indicated that it was he who had been in the fight with Stephen. Fifth, the glasses with the missing lens and fitting David's general glass prescription were found on a chair near where he was in his room when the police arrived. Significantly, the left side of the frame was damaged and the missing lens was found in Stephen's room near his body. Blood-stained clothing, including a green sweater with fibers matching those found under Stephen's fingernails, was washed by David, and his gondolier sweatshirt with blood on the shoulder had been sponged off. Seventh, blood on top of the washing machine powder container, porcelain basin, and various light switches must have come from David's touch. Eight, droplets of blood were found on David's socks, as well as blood which had caused the luminol-observed part of sock prints in other parts of the house. Number nine, the computer had been switched on at 6.44 a.m., and the jury would conclude on all the evidence that this was just after David had returned home from his paper route. Number 10, David's partial recovery of memory might have enabled him to suggest explanations for some of the blood on him, but it didn't explain other vital items like the fingerprints, the clothes, or the glasses. So the prosecution said that David confidently denied things that he couldn't remember, although they had happened. So they knew these things happened, but David was adamant that he couldn't remember. Number 11, if David heard Lanyette making gurgly noises, then she must have been alive and he must have been near her bed. Other comments of his, such as that his mother's eyes were open when he went in and his remark to his aunt that they were dying, dying everywhere, tended to confirm that he remembered being there before and during the deaths. And finally, number 12, not only did the expert pathologist say it was unlikely that Robin shot himself, because of the angle of his gunshot wound, but Robin could not have killed the others because of four reasons. No one else's blood was found on him. There was no blood at all of any type on his socks or shoes. His fingerprints were not on the rifle, although if he had shot himself, he would have been the last person to have gripped it, and no gunpowder traces were found on his hands. 
If he had been the wearer of blood-stained clothing and was intent on suicide, why would he have bothered to change his clothes and be in completely blood-free clothes when he shot himself? All strong points. The judge reminded the jury of the prosecutor's description of David as increasingly disturbed and of David's behavior as unusual and almost obsessional about some strange matters. This was an accurate description of a closing statement in which David was described as unusual in his behavior and a disturbed young man. His behavior had been described as bizarre. The judge referred again to the glasses and the lens falling out and the switching on of the computer at 6.44 a.m. after David's return home at 6.42 to 6.43. The absence of one piece of evidence that Robin had been into the rooms of the deceased on that morning and the absence of any real evidence of suicide. The judge referred to the acceptance by defense counsel that the luminol blood prints must have been David's too. So that's interesting that they conceded that those were David's footprints that had blood on them. Yeah, I mean, you can say that he has a, but he was going to room to room to check on family members. Well, according to his second version of events, yes. Right. So the jury went out for deliberations at 11.45 a.m. on May 29th. Just after 9 p.m., after the jury had asked several questions about the evidence, they returned with a guilty verdict on all five counts. David was sentenced to life in prison, eligible for parole in 16 years. But David Bain maintained his innocence, and he had many supporters, and they ran a lengthy campaign to appeal his case. The initial appeal was dismissed in 1995, and the Privy Council declined to hear his appeal in 1996. The Police Complaints Authority reviewed the police investigation into the Bain family murders in 1997, and they issued a 123-page report which supported its validity. So let's, let's see, uh, two appeals that have failed and one that they didn't even want to review. So zero for three. But things took a turn. They did. I'm still trying to process that, but take a turn they did. Former rugby player Joe Karam didn't believe that David was guilty, and he worked to have the convictions overturned. He visited David in prison many times and wrote books about the case. In 1998, Bain's legal team petitioned the governor general for a pardon. And then in 2000, the justice minister said that the investigation had a number of errors. And in 2007, David Bain's legal team, along with Karam, laid out arguments before the Privy Council. They said that there were concerns over Robin's mental state at the time of the killings and his possible motives. They also questioned several pieces of evidence. The Privy Council decided that their opinion and new evidence showed a substantial miscarriage of justice in this case. David Bain's convictions were thrown out then, and a new trial was ordered. So, he was supposed to stay in jail, according to the Council, but then in May of 2007, he was granted bail. The retrial at the Christchurch High Court began on March 6, 2009. The defense argued that Robin Bain had killed his family members and then himself. The trial lasted about three months, but it only took the jury one day to find him not guilty on all five murder charges. In March 2010, Bain's legal team filed for compensation for wrongful imprisonment. The government wasn't obligated to give compensation, but he could be eligible if he was able to establish his innocence on the balance of probabilities, and if he was considered a victim of exceptional circumstances. Because this was such a high-profile case in New Zealand, the Justice Minister chose Canadian Supreme Court Justice Ian Binney to examine the application for compensation. There was an investigation lasting close to one year, and Binney concluded that Bain was innocent on the balance of probabilities. Yeah, but the new Justice Minister, her name's Judith Collins, was critical of Binney's report. Binney argued that the government was looking for someone to review the case and decline the compensation. Then, in January of 2013, Bain's legal team filed a claim in the High Court asking for a review of Judith Collins' opinions. Then in August of 2014, Collins resigned. So another report was commissioned from retired Australian judge Ian Callanan. Callanan formally announced that he had found Bain not innocent on the balance of probabilities. So the government then found itself in a really difficult spot. 
because the vast majority of New Zealanders thought that David was innocent and should get compensation. But in the end, the government did give David $925,000, but they refused to give an apology, and they claimed that the payment wasn't compensation. So the total cost of the Bain case to the government ended up being about $7 million. David was later quoted saying that his rights were completely abused by Justice Callanan, who had made extremely hurtful comments in finding Bain had not proved his innocence on the balance of probabilities without interviewing Bain himself. Joe Karam described Callanan's report as a train wreck. He said it had numerous issues of concern and that Callanan had made many of the same mistakes that Binney had. So the defense team notified the government that they intended to challenge the quality and the integrity of Callanan's report in court. After he was acquitted, David took a three-month trip to Europe, which was paid for by his supporters. He really had a lot of supporters, and I think you can give most of the credit to the rugby star, because he was popular, and he really got popular opinion on his side. In 2012, David took a job in an engineering firm in Auckland. He married his girlfriend, and they had a son in 2014. In 2017, David changed his name to William Davies, and then he took the last name of his wife. Just as an aside, one of David's groomsmen was convicted of rape and murder of a former girlfriend, and then he confessed to another murder before he took his own life in jail. Huh. Interesting sidelight. I thought so. The vast majority of New Zealanders believe that David Bain was innocent, but there are others who think he did get away with murder. For these people, it was very upsetting to see how people celebrated with him when he was acquitted in his second trial. One juror even gave him a hug. Yeah, that rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, you're supposed to be an impartial jurist. Exactly. Now, if we are to believe that David Bain is innocent, then we have to believe some absolutely incredible things, such as his fingerprints on the gun, yes, but they were from a previous time. Right, and why weren't his father's fingerprints on there? Right. The bruise on his head and scratches on his chest and knee, none of which he could explain, were just a coincidence and not related to the killings in any way. Then the other thing that you have to try to believe is that the lens from his glasses found in Stephen's room happened weeks ago, and David never noticed it. Or nobody ever noticed it. I would only tell you as a person who wears glasses, (laughs) I would certainly notice if one of my lenses was missing. Well, and Stephen had to wear glasses all the time. And then Pharrell Robin got no injuries, despite a life-and-death struggle with the young and healthy Stephen. Only injuries that could be found were on David. Well, the defense would say that Robin had some injuries. But nothing was fresh, so that was debated back and forth. Another thing you'd have to believe, though, is that Stephen's blood on David's clothing had nothing to do with the struggle. Or you could say, I guess, that someone else borrowed David's David's clothing. Right. And then, did Robin decide to wash David's green sweater to remove blood and fibers found under Stephen's fingernails before he killed himself? And was David's bloody palm print on the washing machine? Did that come about after he checked the bodies? And why would he have been in the washroom afterwards? Then the ambulance officer would have had to be wrong when he said that in his opinion, David was pretending to have a seizure. Because if David was innocent, there'd be no reason to fake a seizure. And I guess the thing that really makes me wonder is why would Robin Bain wear gloves? Why would he worry about leaving fingerprints if he was planning to kill himself anyway? I just can't imagine why that would be true. Yeah, I mean, I I think on on balance, I'm I'm just amazed that he was acquitted. Yes, but he was acquitted, so he's officially not guilty. Right. He's a free man. But Uh, yes, it is fascinating, and I do have a lot of doubts about it. Yeah, from what I know, it seems like the prosecution made the case that David killed his family. Yeah, I think a lot of it was the support from the rugby player and the people he brought in. Because when you can just get popular opinion in your favor, it's strong. Even in the courtroom, it holds some power, I believe. Apparently. Yeah. Well, good talk. Thanks, Dickie. Our music is written and produced by Tristan Capel, so thank you, Tristan. 
If you have comments, a case suggestion, a beer recommendation, just anything you want to say to us, send us an email at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com or go to our website where you can write comments or record a voicemail. I'll also leave a link to record a voicemail in our show notes. If you'd like to get your future TCB episodes commercial free, get an extra members only episode each month and get free gifts, you might want to consider subscribing as a tie grabber. You do that by going to tiegrabber.com and you can do that for as little as $4 a month, which is a super bargain. And if you enjoy our show, we would very much appreciate it if you would leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. That helps us out a lot. Now let's do some feedback. So let's start off with a voicemail from Elida. And this is a comment on Into Gander Lake. It's an episode we did recently, I think just last month. And that was about the two little girls who drowned in the lake when they were under the supervision of their father, Nelson. It was also a Mr. Big case. So let's hear what she has to say. Hey, Jill. Hey, Dick. Uh, My name's Elida, and I'm a longtime listener of your show. Absolutely love the the content you guys put out. It's great. Uh, Relaxing for me to listen to. I just got done listening to the episode about Krista and Karen, those sweet little girls. And so I am a longtime sufferer of focal seizures, so I don't have the grand mal. I'm not dealing with the same situation that this guy was. But I do know that you adjust your life appropriately for the condition that you're dealing with. And I know things that I don't do with my daughter because I don't know if I'm going to have a medical emergency. I do know in the state that I live in, it is illegal to drive a vehicle if you've had a seizure within the last 90 days. So I would be a little skeptical about his behavior because it sounds like he's having very regular grand mal seizures. And so why is he driving a vehicle? I'm also a little bit questionable about the mother. Um, Knowing what I know about seizure disorders, I would never let somebody who has grand mal seizures just have possession of my child, but I also wouldn't let them drive a vehicle with my child because of the potential danger of having a seizure behind the wheel of a vehicle. So I I don't mean to victim blame at all. The mother went through something traumatic that's terrible. I would warn anybody out there against letting their small children go with somebody who's having grand mal seizures or even letting somebody drive who has a seizure disorder, maybe step in and drive for them. Um, I also know that I have questionable judgment after I've even had a focal seizure. So I can't make good decisions. There's things that I have a hard time processing. Um, Sometimes I don't even know my name or where I'm at. I can't connect dots on things, so I can't make good decisions. So I don't think I would ever question somebody's decision-making skills after they've had a seizure. So if if somebody got in a vehicle and thought driving was a good idea and later looked back and was like, maybe that wasn't a good idea, um, I could see making poor decisions when you are you know, post seizure like that. But it was just interesting listening to that to that episode, being somebody who deals with a seizure disorder that sounds like it could be an accident. Um, maybe it was, maybe he was completely not to blame at all. But as a seizure sufferer, I feel after listening to your episode, I feel that he used his condition to his advantage in carrying it out, an outcome that he wanted to have happen. So I guess that's my two cents. Keep doing what you guys are doing. Love your episodes. Thank you so much for everything. Bye. Well, thank you, Elida. So your feedback on that is super helpful. This is a case that you kind of have to think about afterwards because it seems like it could go either way, that he did have the seizure and had poor judgment or that he did this on purpose. And I'm kind of like you, I am leaning towards him doing it on purpose just because of his other behavior and the history. I share your feelings about the mother of the girls. I think Jennifer was just not having the best judgment, but certainly she went through heartbreak and I wouldn't blame her for this. But there just seemed to be some poor judgment there and possibly criminal intent on his part. My opinion is that he was faking the seizure. Yes, I know he had seizure disorder. I'm not sure how frequently he had seizures, but it it seems uh, very convenient to have the seizure just at that precise moment when child or children were in danger. Oh, absolutely. But certainly sending those little girls with him was not a good idea. I'm not sure why the judgment was that that was okay to do, but certainly a tragedy. Yes, it was. Yeah. 
Okay, now let's listen to another voicemail. This one is from Karen, and this is a comment on the final visit of Dylan Redwine, which we just did last week. Yeah, it's our very most recent one. All right, let's hear what Karen has to say. Hello there, Jill and Dick. I've just listened to your podcast about Dylan Redwine. I'm just heartbroken. That's just such a sad, sad story. And oh, anyhow, what I wanted to ask, though, is if I don't think that his mum must have realized about those photos. I guess the boys didn't tell her about those photos prior to his going away to see his father. Or uh, speaking to the divorce attorney, she couldn't have known either about those photos, I'm thinking, because wouldn't that be reason enough to say that he didn't have to go? Those photos, I mean, surely to goodness, the court wouldn't mandate that he had to go and visit his father if they had that knowledge ahead of time. It's If that's the case, it's really, really sad that the adults didn't realize about those photos ahead of time. Anyhow, thanks once again for all your work. You're greatly appreciated and send you my warmest thoughts. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Thank you, Karen. You're very appreciated as well. And you've brought up a very good topic. It's an important point, I think. And unfortunately, I have not been able to determine when Corey or Dylan told their mother about these photos. I tend to agree with you that she didn't know about them until after Dylan went missing, although I don't have any proof of that. But I would think if she knew about that, then her attorney would go to the court and say, you know, Dylan doesn't want to go visit his father. He found these photos, which are quite deranged. I wouldn't suggest that anyone look them up. They're horrible. But, you know, there have been many instances where children were forced to go to a parent where it was very dangerous. And I probably brought it up during that episode, but Josh Powell, right? His wife was missing. He had very strange behavior and he had visitation with those boys. There was supposed to be a guardian ad litem with him, but he was able to grab those boys, bring them into the house and murder them. Yeah, sort of push the the guardian out of the way. and Yep. Horrible, horrible thing. Just a horrible, horrible thing. So it's certainly not the first case where we've seen the courts let down a child. Well, I would think that they couldn't have known about it at the time. I, I don't think, I think so. His mother seemed pretty on top of things yeah. from what I could tell. I think it was presented to the attorney that is there any way Dylan could just not go? No other explanation of that. And the attorney said, well, no. He has to. But as you said, and as Karen said, if that was evidence or knowledge at the time, I think you have perfect grounds for not going on visit. Absolutely. I agree. So So I can't imagine that the mother did know. Right. And I don't know about Corey. I mean, he was young. He wasn't a parent. And I think that he was just pretty disgusted. And they kind of joked about it. Yeah. Which I can kind of see because you don't think that a father is going to kill his son over anything, especially Mm -hmm. something like that. That's not going to cross your mind, right? No. As offensive as they were, it's really not an indication that he would kill his son in any way that I can see. But those two cases, Gander Lake and Dillard Redwine, they're both really heartbreaking. Two of the worst cases we've ever covered. All right. So thank you, Karen, very much. We appreciate it. And we have one email suggestion that you could read, Dickie. Well, this will be a quick one. This is from Cindy, one of our loyal listeners. Friend of the show. She says, right now, I'm reading the I-5 killer about Randy Woodfield. So that's her suggestion. Okay, what do we know about it? So, very long story short, Randall Woodfield's a serial rapist, robber, murderer. He committed these crimes between 1975 and the early 80s. He was dubbed the I-5 killer because he committed his crimes along or nearby that highway. He was charged and convicted of just one murder, but he's thought based on DNA testing and other statements from people, including Woodfield, that he has a body count of anywhere from 18 to 44 victims. Wow. Certainly making him a fairly prolific serial killer. Yes, I think I did read a book about that case before we were doing the show. And we're not big serial killer coverers, but once in a while we do that. So we'll certainly keep it on our list. It might be interesting. It might be. It came from a fairly well-to-do family, as I recall. 
and started having difficulty as he hit puberty, teen years, with exposing himself. Hmm. In fact, played football in college, and he was actually drafted by the Green Bay Packers. Wow. He didn't make the team. He was on the taxi squad or something. But the Packers released him because he couldn't stop exposing himself. To who? <laughs> to... Not in the locker room. No, well, everyone was exposed in the locker room. Right. But he was arrested or questioned many times for exposing himself to young girls. So his victims were primarily women or girls. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Cindy. We will keep that on our list of cases to probably do. We will. Thank you, everyone, for listening today and for sharing with us your feedback. We really do appreciate it. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Save you a seat. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.